So for my teaching demonstration, I'm going to be going over separation of powers and checks and balances within the United States government. I'm going to be covering standard two of the social studies standards in South Carolina. The standards reads, demonstrate an understanding of the structure and functions of government at all levels in the United States. Uh, I created three learning objectives. Students will be able to explain the roles of each branch of government, apply the roles of government to checks and balance systems, and lastly, for the activity, students will <laughs> interpret primary resources in order to make logical and constructive arguments about the past. So before I dove into the depths of separation of powers, I really wanted to explore, to refresh the memories about where this idea originated from, because the founding fathers did not create separation of powers. It was actually developed by a French philosopher in the 18th century. Uh, his name is Montesquieu. I am not going to try to pronounce all of the, his long French name, but his last name is Montesquieu. And he published this book in 1748. He published this theory in his book, The Spirit of Laws. And within his publication, he explicitly describes a three-part government. So a government that has three different parts that take over each powers, or, and they're given distinct powers. And these powers, these branches, have the ability to check one another so one branch does not become more powerful than the others. I also wanted to note that James Madison ended up writing about this theory of separation of powers in the Federalist Papers, number 47 all the way to uh, uh, number 51. So why is this separation of powers theory appealed to the founders? Why was the attraction, why, why, why were they so attracted to this theory? They didn't want one person or a group of people to have too much power within the government. They just came from a monarchy. They wanted to, they wanted uh, the powers to, one person to not have all the power. So they decided to split the powers in the government and they wanted to create a check system like Montesquieu describes within his uh, Spirit of Laws publication. So that way all interests of the people are being heard. Applying this theory is going to prevent tyrannical rule because you have the ability to check a branch when they're becoming too powerful. And this is going to encourage your branches to compromise and work together. With the powers being spread apart all aspects of government, they're going to have to actually talk and communicate with each other. And this leads to all interests being heard because the branches of the government have to interact with one another. Uh, I found this quote. Sorry, the image is a little blurry, but I thought it was an Interesting quote, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty, meaning that all these powers have to be separated so people can truly exercise liberty. So we know that the Constitution creates three branches of government. You have the legislative, executive, and judicial. Legislati legislative is Congress, this creates your bicameral legislator, uh, the Senate, the House, or the different parts of Congress. Um, you have the executive, this is your president, and then judicial uh, is the Supreme Court. I'm going to be going over all of these. Legislative branch, what do they do? They make laws. Who is this? Congress. Congress is the legislative branch, the bicameral legislator, the House of Representatives, and the Senate. Uh, when they were actually drafting and creating the Constitution, there was that argument about representation. They compromised with the bicameral legislator. The Senate reflects the New Jersey plan, and the House of Representatives reflects the Virginia plan, and they compromised together. 
uh, they compromised together to so all people's interests were being heard and everyone was being representative. So what can Congress do? Congress is the body that declares war. The president does not declare war. Congress declares war. Congress has the power of the purse. They're the ones that hold the money. Congress also regulates commerce. The executive branch, what do they do? They carry out the laws. They enforce the laws. So if the legislative branch is creating them, the, or, yeah, if the legislative branch is creating them and making them, the executive branch is going to carry out and enforce them and make sure those laws get followed. Who is the executive branch? The president, the vice president, and the cabinet members. The president is the commander-in-chief. He is the the head of the military. He is the one that uh, sends out those orders. That was kind of, um, that was created based off of how George Washington was the head general in the Revolutionary War. The president, he signs or they can sign and negotiate treaties with other countries. Uh, they appoint federal judges, ambassadors, and cabinet members, and they also have the ability to veto laws. We're going to get into some of these powers of the president later in the PowerPoint. Judicial branch, what do they do? They're the ones that are going to interpret these laws. Who is this? This is the Supreme Court and other lower courts. The Supreme Court checks the constitutionality of the laws, meaning do these laws follow our government document? Are these laws doing everything that the government says they would do? These laws are going to protect individual rights. And lastly, they're going to settle legal disputes. So let's say two states get in um, an argument. Uh, federal uh, government or the federal courts are going to be the ones that deal with that. They have that jurisdiction over it. So how do these three branches interact? I'm going to go over all of these uh, within the next and within the coming slides. But here is just an overall picture. A lot of you have seen this before. Um, if I were in a class with students right now, I would have printed this uh, like a blank copy of it and have students write uh, it in. But uh, this is uh, just a demonstration, so I'm not. Okay, how does Congress check the president? So what power, if the president were to get too strong, Congress has these powers written to uh, kind of, if, if the president were to get too powerful, this is what Congress has the ability to do to check the president so that if the president doesn't get too powerful. Congress has the ability to reject any presidential appointment. So earlier, I told you that the president appoints uh, any judicial member. So he appoints the Supreme Court justices, but Congress has to vote on that Supreme Court justice. So he, the president cannot just point blank, pick a person and be like, I want you to be the ambassador. And that's it. It actually has to be voted on by Congress. And this is for judicial judges. This is for ambassadors. This is also for the president's cabinet. So the Department of Education as well. They, everyone um, within his cabinet is voted on as well by Congress. Withhold funding from the president. So if the president isn't doing their job right, they can withhold that money from them. They have the power of the purse. Um, they can impeach the president for presidential crimes. We recently just saw Donald Trump's impeachment. Uh, other presidents have been impeached as well in the past, such as Andrew Johnson. Uh, he was president after Abraham Lincoln. Uh, yes. And they also had the abil ability to override um, a presidential veto but they need a two-thirds majority to do that. So if Congress is to make a law or make a bill, the bill gets placed on the president's desk, and if he doesn't, want, or if they don't want to sign it into law, or if he doesn't want to sign it into, or they don't want to sign it into law, then they do not have to. 
but Congress can actually override that veto with two thirds majority. Um, and we'll get into that later as well, uh, vetoes. How does Congress check the Supreme Court? Congress has the ability to propose constitutional amendments. So if Congress is to make a bill and that bill becomes a law and the Supreme Court comes around and says that Congress can't do that because it goes against the Constitution. Congress then has the ability to make a constitutional amendment. They So if the Supreme Court is saying, like, it is not in the Constitution, Congress has the ability to make a constitutional amendment and write it into the Constitution. So that way that law is then constitutional. Congress has the ability to impeach Supreme Court justices for serious crimes. We know that Supreme Court justices are lifetime appointments. They don't have a term limit. Uh, they are appointed for life. Uh, lastly, decide the court structure below the Supreme Court. So Congress has the ability to do that as well. How does the president check the Supreme Court? So the president is the one that has the ability to nominate Supreme Court justices for life. Like I said, congressional approval. This actually just recently happened. Biden was able to nominate Justice Jackson, who is the lady in the picture on the screen. Um, other recent presidential nominees for Supreme Court justices um, Donald Trump, he uh, appointed Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh uh, within his term. How does the president check Congress? So they have the ability to adjourn Congress in particular situation, but I would say that one of their biggest checks is they have the ability to veto bills that are passed in Congress. So the president is the one that signs bills into laws. They are they have the ability to make that happen. And if they don't want to, they veto it, meaning they will not make that bill become a law. And what I have from the website, uh, the American Presidency Project, they have really good statistics or in data on this. So this is every single president uh with the number of vetoes um since biden is a new president that doesn't have any yet but this is donald trump he had a total of 10 vetoes barack obama a total of 12 vetoes george bush a total of 12 vetoes clinton 37 vetoes so there's a jump there if i had a class of students Right now, we would take a minute and really analyze this data. I would ask them questions regarding uh, all this data. Specifically, I would really want to have kids look at why some have lower ones and then some have higher ones, specifically uh, in this situation. And I would really, I would ask them questions that would have them examine, uh, this is the political parties of Congress at the time. So all of these, like 59% of people in the Senate and House were Democrats. So this has to do with party alikeness. And I would really try to see students to see the correlation between that. Um, the person with the most vetoes is FDR. Uh, 635. I think it's really interesting to go and look all this. But like I said, uh, if I had a class full of students, we would really pause and I would ask them questions for them to look at this data and get those critical thinking skills strengthened. Okay, uh, next slide. Mm. How does the Supreme Court check Congress? One second. How does the Supreme Court check Congress? So this, like I said earlier, uh, they can declare laws unconstitutional through judicial review. So an example of this is during uh, segregation. Uh, states in the South had laws regarding segregation. 
And then in Brown v. Board of Education, they declared all the laws uh, regarding segregation in schools illegal. They said these laws are unconstitutional. Uh, they need to be like stopped. So Brown v. Board uh, declared a segregation in schools unconstitutional and said it went against our constitution. It goes against the Equal Amendment uh, Clause within the 14th Amendment. And we've seen this through other uh, things as well. This is an extremely popular concept uh, in some states. In 2015, same-sex marriage was legalized within uh, all states because of the Supreme Court. They declared laws that said you can't marry the person of the same sex as you as unconstitutional. And now these are all huge Supreme Court cases. Um, yeah. How does the Supreme Court check the executive branch. The Supreme Court has the ability to declare executive actions unconstitutional if they go against the Constitution as well. So the president has the ability to make executive orders, and it's basically kind of like a law, but they don't really need Congress. It's just one of uh, their powers as well. But the Supreme Court can check the executive branch within this, saying, like, listen, like, your order is unconstitutional. And the pictures that I provided for you are looking at Donald Trump and his executive order regarding the Muslim ban. The Supreme Court, I believe it's the court case is Trump v. Hawaii, I think it is. I could be wrong. But anyways, uh, that executive order got stroked down as unconstitutional because of religious discrimination. So that was... um a hot topic in 2017. So I decided to use that as an example here. Oh, um, and then if I had a class full of students, we would go through each scenario. So the president vetoes a health care bill. The bill has a great deal of support in Congress. What can be done? We know that Congress has the ability to override a presidential veto. So that would be the answer I would ask students. We would go through each one of these and see that. Um, for the actual like activity that I had created for a, cl for a classroom full of students is they would use uh, this, the interactive constitution and all that. Is this it? Yeah. Mm, yeah. So directions. Answer the questions below. So they're going to use that website for two, three, and four. And they're basically looking for powers that are not, that I did not list in the PowerPoint. So obviously, I just said some really co like popular powers of each branch. So their task would be to go into the interactive constitution website and look for powers that I did not list. And then there's other questions uh, below it. So that would be the activity that I had for students after that. And what I also like about this is that it gives interpretations of the constitution as well, because I know that some words and phrases can be hard to understand. And so students can read the interpretations to get a better grasp of what's going on. But yes, that is my teaching demonstration.